I'm Vanessa, the associate editor here at Book Riot. Welcome back to another edition of New Release Tuesday. Today I'm going to be talking about some books that come out on Tuesday, July 14th. So first I just really want to quickly say thank you to Rinzi for covering for me while I was out. I took some time off to spend the better part of three weeks, almost a month, back in San Diego where I sheltered in place with family. I was working for most of that time but just didn't want to have to record all the videos <laughs> for that time and uh, have to haul a camera around and all that good stuff. Um, but while Rinzi was indeed just covering for me for that one week so that I wouldn't have to carry the recording equipment with me, we've actually made some changes to our YouTube video schedule and I'm actually talking tossing the new release Tuesday video right back to Rinsey. So this will be my last week doing the new release video. Thank you so much to all of you who rocked along with me. It was really fun getting to do so, uh, but giving it back to Rinsey is just going to all around be better for, I think, everyone's schedule. <laughs> Again, you're going to see some changes to the channel um, overall that I think will just kind of divvy up the workload nicely and will still give you all, you know, a batch of new books to look forward to every week. So thank you to her, her for covering, for taking you know, taking it back, I guess, <laughs> going forward and for all of her help because she definitely guided your girl in the beginning of this process. Okay, so new books. First, what I want to talk about is The Extraordinaries by TJ Klune. And I am the idiot that kept calling it The Extraordinaires for weeks, even though I'd already read the book and should have known from reading it. Like, I don't know, my eyes just did not connect the letters well. <laughs> but again, The Extraordinaries is what it's called. And this is the YA debut from author T.J. Klune, who is the author of the wildly popular House in the Cerulean Sea that came out, oh my gosh, was that this year or last year? I have no concept of time. But it is his most recent release, and that book just made such a huge splash at Book Riot with our readers, our contributors, our staff, like everyone loves that book. I haven't read it yet. I own it. <laughs> but I did want to read this one specifically to talk about it with you all here. And it is so good. It is stellar on audio. Let me tell you about the plot. So our main character, Nick, is a high schooler. He has ADHD. He lives in Nova City, where superheroes called extraordinaries in the book are a real thing. He is dealing with a loss. And his parents were both police officers. His father still is. But his mother was unfortunately within, I think, the last year or so when the book takes place, killed in an armed robbery. So both he and his father are trying to adjust to this new normal without her in it. And of course it's, you know, difficult for both of them for a variety of grief related reasons. Nick is also super obsessed with The Extraordinary, specifically with Shadowstar. And he is so obsessed that he writes this like wildly popular and very detailed fan fiction. Like this, this is like his thing. It's <laughs> his whole like lifeblood goes into this endeavor. And as again, this like big old crush everybody knows him for on, on Shadowstar. And that gets real awkward because one day he has a chance encounter with Shadowstar where he and his friend are about to be the victims of a mugging when Shadowstar steps in, saves the day and saves their lives. So it's it's all kinds of awkward. That scene is was written just like to perfection. It's just so like ah, secondhand embarrassment cringy, <laughs> but Nick manages to kind of pull it together at the last second and ends up getting an autograph and a, you know, like signature from, or an autograph and a signature, an autograph and a picture <laughs> from Shadowstar. And as he looks back on it, Nick realizes that the autograph is addressed to him both his first and last name, even though he definitely didn't give Shadowstar his last name. So he's like, hmm, this must mean that I'm an extraordinary. And he concocts this whole elaborate plan that he, you know, wants his friends to help him with at which he is going to become an extraordinary. It's a hot mess. The dialogue in this story is so good. So he, his best friend's name is Seth and he's basically like wants him to come along with this mission, you know, come hell or high water, like I'll do it with or without you. Seth is again, his best buddy and like might also kind of be the love of his life. We'll see. And, and he's got some secrets of his own that like Nick doesn't exactly pick up on. The there's a lot of great queer representation in general. Nick himself is gay, as is uh actually I can't remember if Seth is bi, but there's a great lesbian couple in there. There's just again a lot like TJ Klune writes books that are queer AF and makes no qualms about it, and I love that about them. I like we need more of this. We need good solid representation. The dad son dynamic in this book is so freaking stellar. Like the dad is really fun and quirky. They have like a very um, like bantery relationship <laughs> that's just a, a delight to read on the page. It's, it's that beautiful mixture of like, I'm going to parent you, but like, not, I was gonna say I'm a cool dad, but not in the like ironic way and like an actual cool dad way. It's just, oh, it was so fun to spend time with this book. It's just, oh, so lovely. I cannot 
wait to dive into House in this Rule and see if it's anything like this. So again, that is The Extraordinaries by TJ Cliff. Next is a book brought to us by our sponsor, and that is Flatiron Books. Thanks so much to them for sponsoring this week's video. And that title is Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby. This is a thriller that Lee Child has called astonishingly good, and it's billed as kind of a mashup of Ocean's Eleven and Drive with a Southern Noir twist. So, you know, my interest is automatically piqued. <laughs> it's a searing operatic story of a man who's pushed to his limits by poverty, by race, and by his own former life of crime. Walter Mosley has called it an intoxicating thrill of a ride. Anything that Walter Mosley puts a stamp of approval on is a thing that I'm interested in. So pick this one up wherever books are sold. Again, that is Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby. And thank you to Flatiron Books for sponsoring this video. Next is Running by Natalia Sylvester, which is one that I've had on my radar for some time. And it was so great to finally read it. This definitely goes in the category of those books I wish were around when I was younger. It's a story of a young Cuban-American teenager named Mariana Ruiz. She's 15 and her father has been a politician for you know most of her life she has stood you know by his side as he's gone from like local elections all the way to his you know currency in the US Senate but things are changing a lot and quickly because her dad is now running for president as you will undoubtedly be shocked to hear <laughs> running for president is a whole different ball game the level of scrutiny is next level it's beyond anything she could have imagined that she was you know already kind of used to and it's uncomfortable so the night before the family's about to partake in this like 60 minute style interview that's like a tour of their home she actually runs away and of course that does not make matters any better it makes them far worse a bunch of videos about her go viral there's a bunch of like manufactured scandal and again it, things just went from bad to worse because of this. So everything feels like a mess. It's all coming to this big, like just uncomfortable head when a lot of stuff starts to come out about her father. But it's just, you know, kind of a history of how her father has voted, what his policies have been, like where he stands on certain issues. And a lot of it is not at all what Mari had come to expect and know of her father. And she realizes she like doesn't know him as well as she thought she does. So all of these complicated questions suddenly arise. How do you like find your voice when the world is literally watching you? How do you disagree with your father when you're doing so on this like national stage? What do you do when your dad stops being your hero and when you have the chance to speak up, you know, can and will you take it? I love this like theme of finding your voice, in particular right now in this political moment when I think a lot of us have had to look around and have these tough conversations with people that we know and love in our life and that it's not so easy to just like disconnect from. Again, for so many reasons, this is the kind of book that I wish I'd had when I was younger just to like inspire young women to yeah find their voice and to you know take ownership of their beliefs and feelings and to feel validated to speak up when you know it's necessary so again this is just such a great book i highly recommend that you pick it up and <laughs> that is running by natalia sylvester next is well-behaved indian women by somia dave this is such a fun book i love multi-generational stories and that's what this is it's the story of three indian women we have simran who is in her 20s in uh, present day the book i think takes place in 2018 and then her mother nandini who immigrated to the united states from india and then nandini's mother mimi simran's grandmother and the story you know in part focuses on the relationship specifically between nandini and simran simran has tried very hard to like make her family proud, but also feels like nothing she ever does is good enough. <laughs> you know, she was dating her now fiance behind her family's back. <laughs> so when they found that out, they were like, ah, a little, you know, it didn't seem to matter that he is in grad school, I think, to become a doctor and she's in grad school to become a psychologist. Like on paper, they're, you know, a great couple, but the dating behind the back really like just ruffled some feathers. The fact that she chose to be a psychologist instead of a doctor has also ruffled some feathers. She just has this very like contentious relationship with her mother who, you know, came over from India and has just, you know, parented perhaps on the stern side, but all of the sacrifices and decisions that she's made were coming from a place of not wanting her children to go through some of what she went through as, you know, a child and a young woman. Simran has also always wanted to be a writer and that is not like a journalist specifically and not a passion that her family, in particular her mother, could get behind. Her mother constantly refers to that as like her little writing hobby which uh, as I said on this week's episode of all the books, like I'm so familiar with this like Brown family habit of putting the word little in front of something that you love and just making you feel like it's small. <laughs> so I related a lot to some of the portions in this book. Um, but a chance encounter with an actual journalist 
really just flips the script for Simran and she's looking at her life and wondering if she a wants to marry this man that she's engaged to and b does she really want to continue with this you know career path in psychology she ends up going to India to just get some perspective because again her and her mother are just butting heads and while she's there you know spends time with her grandmother Mimi who has a couple of secret burdens that she is keeping to herself and who is determined to essentially help be the bridge between her daughter and her granddaughter, knowing herself that she made certain mistakes with Nandini that she wishes she could take back. I, again, love a multi-generational story, and I love stories that dive like deep into the complexity of women's personalities and how, you know, sometimes what you see on the surface, it just goes so much deeper if you, you know, take the time to learn more about it. And I also love books that explore how... And this isn't necessarily particular to women. I think just in general, how we come to see our parents, you know, differently as we grow into our own adulthood. Oftentimes I think we empathize with them better. Sometimes we don't. Uh, but yeah, it was just a really lovely story. So great to spend time with these three very dynamic and independent women who were all just doing the best they could with what they knew and had at the time. Oh, it was so nice. So again, that is Well-Behaved Indian Women by Somia Dave. Next is a book that I've been waiting for with bated breath. I just haven't had time to read it yet. And that is Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. David Mitchell, yo. <laughs> so I actually only read one of his books and it's not even his most popular. It's The Bone Clocks. And I sent that, I'll put it here. I'll make sure that I find it. Meme, you know, the woman with the like, mathematical calculations. I sent that meme to everybody who recommended this book to me because I was like, how, how do these things all connect? Like David Mitchell's brain just works in a way that is much cooler than mine. But you know, thank goodness, because he writes some fantastic literature. This book is, as from everyone I know who's read it, just also phenomenal. And like David Mitchell tends to do, it's just like very different from all the rest of his books. He likes to switch up the, the format and kind of genre a lot. This one is set in 1960s London in the music scene, and it's specifically about a band called Utopia Avenue. The band is comprised of three members. We have Elf, who is the like lead folk singer, we have Dean, who is the bassist, and then the guitar player is Jasper. And this is, you know, the, the band essentially like once burned bright, fast and bright <laughs> in this era of like war, sex, drugs, and you know, rock and roll. It's an exploration of their hopes, their dreams, their worries, their, you know, them trying to create art in the middle of just everything going on in late, you know, uh, like 1960s uh, London in the music scene. Dean just has like the worst luck. <laughs> he literally has lost, you know, everything. He's still trying to like maintain, you know, true to his craft in the middle of having just lost like everything that's important and essential to him. Elf is so super talented as a singer, but she's got a lot of insecurities and it's just hard in general to be a woman in that, you know, space of rock and roll. So that comes with a whole set of problems. Jasper is that like typical brilliant but tortured artist. He's like a guitar, just woo, like genius, but again, tortured. As with, again, all David Mitchell books, which again, I've only read one. And even that I was sitting there like, you know, <laughs> doing the last scene from a beautiful mind. <laughs> like he leaves a lot of Easter eggs in there that connect like side characters, both from the main book and then from his other books. So if you've read the rest of his or any of the rest of his books, you know, pick up on those pieces. He, he leaves those Easter eggs in every single one of his books. It's like, he's got this vision for this grand, like, masterpiece that he will have finished you know at the end of his life and also apparently has tons of cameos in here for to actual like celebrities at the time so this uh just for all the david mitchell -y reasons and more sounds like a fantastic read uh liberty talked it up so much on this week's episode of all the books so i feel pretty confident recommending that one to you so again that is utopia avenue by david mitchell and last, I'm bringing you and hitting us home with a work of horror, and that is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. So this is a scary, creepy, supernatural revenge horror <laughs> novel. It's about four young or four Native American men. And in the prologue, we find that one of them has been dispatched. He's been killed. And the rest of the book is about the remaining three of that, you know, original foursome young men trying to, they're really, they're running. <laughs> they're running from this thing. And the thing that is chasing them 
as a result of a terrible and like horrifying thing that happened to them as kids on a hunting trip. The story is about like the the stress, the worry, the running from this thing that, you know, will not rest until it has claimed them. And it's, I think Liberty called it Michael Myers with antlers. <laughs> so I'll just let you have that. <laughs> but it is apparently intense and gory and scary and wild. And it also explores like the stereotypes, the abuse, the racism that indigenous peoples, in this case, you know, Native Americans have gone through and continue to go through for everything from like a microaggression to like a full blown act of, you know, violence and intolerance. So I don't want to say too much more. I haven't read this one either, but again, just based on what I know, you kind of want to just go in knowing that and let it just, get under your skin from there. <laughs> so again, uh, I, I think I've mentioned in a couple of these videos that horror and romance are two of the things that I'm looking to right now. It just seems like they're easier to read in, you know, pandemic times. So again, I'm going to wrap us up with a work of horror today. And that is The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. That's all I've got today. I feel like I was really rambly. <laughs> sorry if that is the case. I was just really excited to talk to you about new books. We're reaching that interesting time in the year now where because so many books got moved around in the spring, now all those books are starting to come out. And I think we're going to see a lot of bottlenecking on releases from here, you know, going forward. So it's hard to pick just a certain number of books to talk about, which is why I talked about a few extra than I normally might have. But it was my last video, so I felt like I could do that. <laughs> Thanks so much to everybody for following along. I am happy again to pass the baton right back to Rinsey since, you know, I love her, you love her, we all love her. So let's welcome her back with open arms. I will be, you know, on the back end over at Book Riot doing the associate editor thing. Otherwise, make sure to show Rinsey lots of love. Happy reading, and I will catch you all later.